Okay. So what happened here is that uh, somebody in the news said, Alexa, order a dollhouse. Now you might feel, okay, now what's the big deal there? But if you're a home which has that smart home device called Alexa Echo uh, from Amazon, it is sort of, you know, trained to give you a, uh, an order or, you know, add to cart or <coughs> add to shipment of the dollhouse. Right, so just having a TV, somebody say, you know, I want a dollhouse, resulted in thousands of people ordering it. Uh, we are having some disturbance. Uh, can we mute the other? Okay, thank you. All right, so, uh, so those are, you know, the regular uh, problems that are faced. So we had somebody from Amazon actually come to Quisat and talk about their, you know, real issues, right? So one of them was that uh, they are having a problem with Indians using Alexa, right? What is the problem? Generally, uh, we would think uh, that, you know, I want to play a song, right? So if this Alexa Echo Dot is at home, I'll say, Alexa, uh, I want to play uh, Kishore Kumar songs. Right. So Alexa will go. It will look at uh, what is the list of uh, audio uh, catalog available. Okay. So look at singer whether it matches Kishore Kumar. Uh, maybe music composer whether it you know maybe you might say I want to play a Rahman song. Right. So whether the music composer matches the word that was mentioned. Right. So any of these uh, could be there. Right. Now once he uh, does that, he'll select okay. You know Kishore Kumar. There is hundred songs in Amazon's list. Right or 500 songs, right? It will randomly or by some order play these songs, right? Now the problem is this is designed with you know US or Europe in mind, right? Where most of the time the singer or the composer is important, but in India the thinking is different, right? So here people don't just say you know who's the singer, you know I want a Rafi song or a you know Shreya Ghoshal song. People also say you know can you play me a Salman Khan song? Right now what would the program do? Program will go and check whether the singer matches Salman Khan, whether uh, the music composer matches Salman Khan. I don't know how many songs Salman Khan has sung, but I would think it is in single digits, right? So you might get a list of songs that you have no interest in, right? Or if you say you want to play Mohanlal songs, they might find maybe 10, 15 songs he has sung and it will play only those 15 songs. Whereas I was looking for maybe hundreds of songs, right? So <laughs> the reason why this is important is because this is programmed such that we are thinking only for those keywords, you know, cast, actor, things like that. And they are thinking only about singer and things like that. Another problem is we always say put Kishore Kumar song. We don't say play Kishore Kumar song because that is another usage problem, right? We always have been using the convention of putting a cassette inside a record to play music. Right. Even if the CD came, we have been using put the CD. Right. Whereas abroad, people say play the CD or play the cassette. Right. So when we came to ordering these IoT devices, there also we are using put Mohanlal song, not play Mohanlal song. So this put has to become a keyword in India, and this put will not be a keyword in uh, US or so. Some localization also has to happen. Right? So the challenges in implementing even a simple can you play music is humongous, right? So all these things have to be taken into account when you are building something automated because the point of automation is to make life simple, not too complicated, right? So somebody says, you know, put Mohanlal song, he's going to get frustrated if the song is not played, okay? So as I said, there is a lot of challenges. So initially I'll go through uh, one particular uh, challenge, uh, sorry, uh, which is in pollution. Uh, I don't know whether the video will work. I don't know whether the video will work. Academy of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, IMA, with the Rotary Club, and the Sahagarna Thodian, Paribad is in the same way. The assistant collector, Imba Shekharan, CPM Jilas, and the Sankhana Paravahil.
Okay, so uh, the reason I wanted to show this is this particular project or task I'm going to talk about is uh, collaboration with the Indian Medical Association where, you know, one of the doctors had a project where they wanted to, uh, this is not IMA, this is uh, pulmonary doctors. It's sort of one branch of it with respect to chest, uh, so uh, respiratory systems. So they wanted to understand what is the pollution level in Kochi, right? So in Trivandrum, it is uh, very well cap captured. So this was an effort by them to get more awareness going. Some, uh, you know, traffic wardens, some, you know, giving masks and things like that. So I'll get to that a little later. Now, the motivation here is, you know, when you think about air pollution, we think about Beijing, right? We think about Beijing because, you know, we always feel like when somebody else is at fault. So China has the most polluted city or things like that. So I had shown word cloud of IoT. Right. When IoT comes, you can see, you know, other words sitting here, which is, you know, framework services, Internet, things like that. Similarly, if you take a word cloud of Beijing, these are the words that will show up. Right. So it's sort of showing, you know, air quality is one among them. Right. Why would air quality be a related word to Beijing? Because there are so many news articles where people are talking about pollution. Right. So it is a related word to it. You know, other normal words will be, okay, in you know, a city, terminal, some airport. Right, <coughs> wall because somebody might be going to Great Wall from there. Maybe there is an opera house there, right? Maybe there is a Beijing orchestra which is famous, right? So, but it is unusual for pollution and air quality to be here. Rest everything really makes sense, right? What is the weather in Beijing? What is the role in Beijing? And right? all those words make sense. And we also know that New Delhi is another polluted place, right? If you do the word cloud, you will find pollution as one of them. Right, because when you search Delhi, that is also another aspect, uh, you know, that sort of uh, affects it. Okay. Now, we always talk about New Delhi when it comes to pollution, but it is not the most polluted Indian city. Right. So I think this ten minutes of talk I might have given at uh, your college before, if I've uh, spoken to you before. But you know, I'll go through it because it's a very good application of IoT. Okay. Now. Delhi is not the most polluted city in India, right? There is much, uh, many others in the list. So this is one study, you know, pollution is not like, uh, you know, uh, exact data, you know, depends on who measured it. You know, you can measure Delhi's uh, temperature in, you know, in front of parliament, you can do it in Karolbag, you can do it in Kanaut place, right? So it totally differs, right? It should be an average of all those things, right? So this is one measurement. But if you take the whole world, you know, in the top 20, there is actually 10 cities, right? But really, there is only three, four Chinese cities in this list, at least. So why are we always looking at okay, China as the most polluted place, right? Why, why not we look into India as the most polluted place in terms of air quality? The real reason is because Delhi is a top tier metro city. The rest of the cities are not, you know, too big. Right? These tier two cities do not make Times of India news or Indian Express or Hindu news. Right? It may be their local edition, but we don't really care about what's the pollution in Gwalior, to be frank. Right? But we do care about what is the pollution of Kochi. Right? Because at least some of us are living here, people who are attending it <laughs> from here. Okay. Now, before going there, we should define what is this pollution, right? I know I'm deviating from IoT a bit here, but at least you might have to give me two slides before going back to IoT. It is particulate matter, PM 2.5, which is a measurement. It just means that, you know, that is the size of the particle, right? So this is, if this is a hair strand, this is, you know, individual sand particles, right? This will be PM 10 size. This will be PM 2.5 size, which is like a ring around this blue. Right. So these are, you know, major items. It's like, you know, suspended air particles. Right. There are other gases, you know, all those are put in here and people sort of define the quality index called AQI, which is like a mixture of this. So, right. If you are in a combination of these things, you might be having good air, satisfactory air, polluted, poor, very poor, severe. Right. So that is how you measure this. Right. And if you take the pollution map of India, it is, you know, it is bad in many, many, many places. Right. Generally, South India is slightly better than the North, right? But it is pretty bad everywhere. You can go to, uh, you know, the Pollution Control Board website of uh, 
Kerala and you'll find live at that point of time it was showing Trivandrum. So I just took the screenshot. You know, it is 93, 100 is where it gets bad. So it was satisfactory on that particular day. Right. So I haven't looked at, you know, every day or taken an average or things like that. Right. So you will get measurement. Now you might think like, you know, okay, let's just place it in different places and, you know, identify what is the pollution, but you know, it's not that easy. People don't want pollution monitoring things near the neighborhood. Let's say if you're having a school, will you have a pollution monitoring board right in front of the school? The parents will be worried whether their children are, you know, breathing bad quality air. Right. So the school will resist having this. If you are building a flat, the flat builder will resist having this. Right. He wants to show that this is the greatest place to live in. Right. So there is a lot of interest in terms of measuring pollution. So it's you know not as easy as it's shown. So let's come back to IoT. <clears throat> so, you know, IoT could mean a lot of things. We are going to take a very low power device. Uh, so when this air quality index thing was learned by me, you know, when that IMA thing interest Came in. So I asked some of my students just to build a very crude application. So how can you build a air quality indicator? <coughs> you can get by these gas sensors, which are readily available in the market online. You can just order, you know, dust sensors, you know, it's like a laser thing. You, you can, you know, harmless laser thing where you can get the measurement, right? You can just connect it to an LCD display, some Wi-Fi. You can send it to mobile phone, create an app or just have a thing speak or something, right? So this is a very simple project that can be done, right? And if you get a mix of these measurements, you can sort of come up with an AQI like metrics, right? Uh, how you define AQI is still, you know, there are different different ways, but you know, if you get this, you can sort of get an indicator of AQI, right? But uh, there is also, you know, production level, you know, uh, things already available there, right? So there is a company which is by a Cusat alumni called Alcadex who supplies these kind of devices, which can measure these things. Right, so they have uh, deployed it in different cities. I don't think Kochi is one of them, but I think, you know, this is pictures courtesy of them. They have, you know, uh, things slides of theirs where they have shown what can be done. You know, with respect to a city, you can measure what is the AQI level. Okay. Another company which is doing that is Airveda. Right, so they have this kind of monitors. They had donated two or three of them. <coughs> we had installed it in the collector's office and, you know, MLA and police commissioner and so on. So they also have, you know, uh, mobile app where they can track this and things like that, right? So in IoT and pollution, uh, you know, with respect to quality and weather monitoring and things like that, it is already being used, right? How much popular it's questionable. Uh, prevention and remedies, if you're aware of this is, you know, based on this particulate matter and things like that, we could say, okay, you know, it is more because of industry problem, more because of vehicle problem, more because of, you know, some fossil fuel or uh, home emissions and things like that, right? Some burning uh, we see in, you know, okay, Punjab wildfire or field uh, farmers are burning and things like that, right? So there are different sources and you don't need to get to that. And what is the solution for this? Of course, it is cleaner energy, right? I'm deviating from this, but then I'll come to that after uh, uh, this slide, right? So one of the major problems with energy is that we have been still using the same type of energy for past 20, 30 years. It is still hydroelectric energy and the nuclear energy and you know all those forms of energy, right? And all our vehicles have been still working on petrol and diesel, right? These days it is moving towards electric. Uh, you have Nissan Leaf, you have uh, Tesla, Prime, the US guy, right? So even if you go there, the battery technology has to improve, right? So that is still fallen behind. So you know. We are having still uh, limitations to how far after one charge you can go, right? So only if we get past that, we can, you know, reduce our, our consumption of fossil fuel. And things like that. So this is like a marketing thing they do in uh, China about, you know, they make, this is like a dust collection thing that is in the parks, which can eat smog and they'll take that and create rings for creating awareness. So that brings us to uh, what is the pollution of Kochi? So, if you take a word cloud, these are the things that will come up. So fortunately, pollution is not one among them, right? You can see moon or metro, all those things, at least when I search for it, right? it might have changed now. Maybe there is flood also, right? But uh, the word cloud is different, right? But what is the pollution now? This is um, some effort that we did uh, along with uh, the collector at that time, Safarullah. Uh, about uh, putting the pollution monitors. You can see the Airveda uh, 
device that is put here anyway uh, so what is the value right now it is in the 100 range just to give your i, I don't have the latest numbers but it is in the 100 range it's sort of you know polluted but not so polluted it depends on the day we are measuring okay so that's an application of iot that brings me to the final two topics which is probably going to take more time than the introduction and the application i mentioned okay uh, so i'll do the security of iot and probably take a couple of minutes break to drink of some water and come back again right so let's do the security of iot applications right <laughs> so the device i am going to talk about is amy right we have a collaborating uh, one second maybe i'll entertain some questions if there are any uh, you can oh i'm hearing that uh, voice is feeble it is later are am i audible properly yes sir audible okay so if there yeah. are any questions you can uh, type now and then uh, i think i'm yeah around 70 slides i'm like around 30 so uh, if there are any questions you can ask now or i'll do this topic and take a small break okay i think uh, there aren't any anyway i don't expect it to also i haven't told and told anything that is you know high five right <clears throat> okay so let's get to potentially high five stuff right so we have been working with a company called curio which is uh, having a smart home operation uh, this is another project we had done uh, so they have uh, AMI actually stands for Advanced Machine Intelligence Ecosystem. This is their device, right? It can talk to Amazon Alexa uh, device, the Echo. It's venture capital funded uh, part, selected as among the top 50 Reliance Next program startup. And some of their marketing slides, you know, they have <coughs> different, you know, things that can be connected to it. Uh, they are serviced via Amazon Web Services, right? So just that. Now we come to IoT and security, right? So if you have a smart home at you know your place, you're having you know let's not think Amy, let's think anything else, right? So each of these devices is actually having a brain of its own, right? So you are having maybe your trash can is saying if you don't sell a send us cash, your reputation will be in trash, right? As in if you are putting a document here. You should be suspicious whether this is able to read what is in there. Like a small column is saying, if you don't send me money in Bitcoin, I will not put you to sleep. Right? So if somebody can hack this in some ways, you know, he can put your house in danger. Right? Of course, this is an exaggeration. Right? It is saying Internet of Internet things. It is saying Internet of ransomware things. Ransom is like you know you're hijacking and asking for <coughs> payoff. Right? So. Uh, it's a joke on IoT saying, you know, you're making all these machines to become an enemy of yours, right? Okay. So how do you define IoT and security, right? So this is uh, one slide by a professor I have taken class with called Dr. Patrick Shamond, who does a lot of research in this area. You know, he has started it like 10, 15 years back, right? So he has sort of given this graph where he is talking about you know different levels of abstraction right so at the lowest level with the highest level right so uh, these are headings risk and countermeasure what risk means is what is the risk in the system countermeasure means how do you solve the risk <coughs> right so eavesdropping means you know i am listening to something right so if you are sending something from a to b you need to have a channel that is secure if it is not secure, somebody can eavesdrop. As in, I can read the data here. So what should I do? I should put a countermeasure. What is my countermeasure? I'll encrypt. I'll encrypt the data and send it so that even if he listens, he gets the data, he is not able to descramble it, decrypt it, and read what is it. Right? So that is the risk and encryption is the solution. Right? So that's an IoT threat and a countermeasure. Now, even if you do that, there are problems uh, posed by analysis. You know, people have come up with very clever ways of understanding this. Right? So there is something called timing analysis. So I'll explain to you timing analysis. You know, it has nothing to do with this figure. <clears throat> so if you have a code, right? If you have a chip which is going to take that code and understand whether the code is correct or not. <clears throat> Maybe the code is 10 bit. Right? Only if you have that code, you can decrypt it. Right, so the attacker who gets this chip, 
he tries a 10 bit code the chip will say you know this is rejected now he'll try another 10 bit code it's it's rejected now if it's a binary code he has to try two raised to 10 combinations that takes a lot of time if it is a alphabet sort of thing it is 26 possible combinations right not possible combination 26 letters instead of two so it is 26 to the power of something that's huge right if it's alpha numeric even bigger right but one thing you have to be careful is that let's say let's keep it simple 10 bits binary you take the first bit you do some checks maybe the bit is correct then you take the second bit maybe it is correct maybe third bit it is correct maybe only at the seventh bit it was wrong so after the seventh bit i'll reject right maybe another code was given the second bit itself was wrong after the second bit itself i'll reject if you are doing it in different different you know time points one person can sort of understand whether it is you know having two things correct or eight things correct if you do a timing analysis because you didn't reject it in constant time even if it's two bits correct or 10 eight bits correct you should get all this you should analyze every bit and you should give a result after the 10 bits so that you don't get a hint because if you ever get to a point where eight bits are correct all you need to do is you have reduced it to a two raised to two four bit problem i need to try 00 01 10 11 1 for the last two bits that's it right so timing analysis is a way to do it i gave an explicit very simple you know example of course no key is below 128 bit right so the chips are much more complicated right it's not just you know one bit per analysis and things like that but if you're wrong and if you're right you should never give out a hint how much right and how much wrong that is the point i want to stress right so constant time execution is one way of preventing this <laughs> right even if you're right or wrong you'll do all this right another way people find out issues is another risk which is called electromagnetic analysis it is not just you know time maybe how much percentage of your circuitry was working i'll give you another picture here so if your bits are correct more parts of your ic will work and more power will be consumed so if more power is consumed your bit to number of bits or the bits that were given is more correct potentially right if nothing is being consumed you know you are just faking it by constant execution right so those are side channel attacks right you are not straight for giving a straight forward attack you know i know some of this sounds very uh, difficult but people have achieved this right so we'll show um, not electromagnetic we'll show optical attack uh, towards that okay so that is uh, what is em analysis and side channel analysis so you know this is sort of showing what are the iot risks with respect to hardware right so uh, in general you can define a attack as you know you are having side channel attack as you know you are having an input and an output but there is another leakage of information which is sort of giving an hint maybe it's time maybe it's electromagnetic field maybe it's power maybe it's current being drawn right so something else is giving the hint to the attack right so as i said here unintentional output to measure data right so we need to be very careful about that okay i think i discussed this a bit right so sort of showing an aes uh, decryption but uh, yeah <clears throat> so this is another topic in iot security called trojans right you might find a lot of you know research uh, papers in this it is a older topic uh, let me see if, yeah so that slide is not there so this is a problem that was defined in the 90s and early 2000 right so there is a agency defense research agency called darpa in the us which sort of puts out a problem right so this was an image from the problem showing the life cycle of an ic chip so this is the final ics this is like some development board this is some distribution channel this is assembly this is fabrication this is design so it is showing that in this whole process issues or hackings can come in every stage <coughs> right in the design stage somebody might clone your design in the fabrication stage somebody might defectively manufacture it in the assembly stage there might be some tampering right so they are saying you know at every point of such uh, you know of this uh, uh, life cycle of the ic 
we are having this problem right now detecting trojans right so uh, oh by the way trojan is an unknown issue that is being put into this right so it's an another word for that in the hardware iot industry okay now there could be different types of trojan attacks one could be destructive right so it is sort of going to destroy the device another is non destructive which is what the side channel analysis we were looking at right so you can detect it by not destroying the chip you can detect it by destroying the chip now just imagine why is this dangerous why is this dangerous oh, just a second i got a phone call which might have interrupted okay this is dangerous because defense industry was concerned that all these chips are made in china right so let's say you are having a chip which is going to have a program which is going to guide a missile right you are giving an input to the missile in some fashion saying that you know this is the coordinates longitude latitude where the missile will be sent if the chip is manufactured there if the software is assembled in china and it is sent back to us how can us trust that when the missile is fired it will go to china what if they have written some sort of <coughs> some sort of you know hack so that the missile never goes to the destination once the ic is manufactured are you going to put it under a microscope and find this out during this assembly of this how are you going to determine whether the design or the manufacturing or the distribution anything has been tampered people put distribution here because you might have manufactured that ic and everything was tested by you but during the distribution if you remove that ic and put another ic in there is no more protection right so counterfeits are a problem too right so all these issues have to be there. so trojans you know are sort of circuits you know this is sort of coming from that trojan concept of you know you might have seen the movie troy or might have heard of the <coughs> sparta uh, story right so there is a horse inside which soldiers are coming in and people are taking the horse inside thinking that okay it's just a horse and then the soldiers come in and kill everybody right so that is the indicator here right so you might have something which is sleeping at the moment but when the real problem comes it will wake up and attack right so now uh one second yeah now uh, you know uh, you might uh, think okay now how can i protect it right so i am not going to give solutions for all these parts of the life cycle but let's take one or two <coughs> and uh, try to go over it right so let's just think about how can me uh, can be secure right so what is the basic part of security at the end of the day you have to do some cryptography you know which might mean that you are generating some random number as a key or something like that right so at the basic level there is some random number being generated <coughs> there is some cryptography being done your network protocols are protecting it right is the solution energy efficient why is that important because it's an iot device this is not a high performance computer if i am going to use a light bulb which has a endpoint which is iot i am not going to be able to run some complex cryptography algorithms right i'm going a very simple one right so it has to be energy efficient also so that is where a concept called puff comes in right it is called physically unclonable function okay let me just take a pause to see if uh, there is any questions <laughs> you can put it there i think you know i think past 30 slide number 30 there is a little bit more technical content okay <laughs> so there is something called a physically unclonable function uh, so you can say your fingerprint is a puff why is your fingerprint a puff it is a naturally occurring thing which you are using for identification right so this is the model of a puff right you are giving uh, you know a challenge to the puff and you are getting a response right it is going to say whether this fingerprint match the challenge or not so the challenge is i am giving my fingerprint the response is whether the challenge match the fingerprint or not right so it's a challenge response mechanism <clears throat> which can you know tell whether the authentication is there now fingerprint is one i can uh, replace it with any natural stuff right and that natural thing should be unclonable 
right no two people should have it and it should be very specific right if i make a chip another chip should not have it so fingerprint is one right assuming no two people have fingerprint right at least no two recognizable people have fingerprint right we cannot say in human history it's the same but at least two recognizable people don't have it. <coughs> this is microscope image of paper so your regular a4 paper under a microscope will show strands of this polymer right if you take a photo of that and i say this is my authentication this particular thing right that is an unclonable function in my opinion because you can manufacture as many papers as you want but no other paper when put under the microscope will have this pattern this is a unique pattern because this is a naturally occurring thing it is a you know pulp of wood you know treated and to create a piece of paper and you are getting all this right strands has a pattern right so it's an unclonable pattern so this particular photo can be used as a key right so even if someone steals this key right he knows this pattern he cannot make a counterfeit because how will he manufacture paper and tell the paper that i need this pattern inside the paper it's not possible right so those are physically unclonable functions but we are talking about ic chips there is no point in talking about fingerprint or paper here because i cannot insert a piece of paper as a fingerprint inside an ic right so you have to come up with electronic circuits for this so let's define it a little bit more so i'm going to have some more mathematical things i'll uh, not go through it you know in very detail but i'll uh, give you some idea right it is physical you know there is some function or physical quantity being measured it is unclonable <coughs> as in you know you cannot clone it at all uh it's a function in the sense that if you give an input it will check and give an output whether it's matching or not right so this is what we have to achieve and these are the properties right we don't need to do the mathematical part but at least let's understand what is marked in red it has to be unique in the sense that if you make a puff you cannot reproduce it here reproduce means if you make a puff and if you give an input x it should always give y that should be reproducible right if i give an input and say is this this fingerprint if it's yes it should always say yes if it is no it should always say no it should not like behave differently with respect to time it is unclonable in the sense that if you have a puff you cannot make another puff of the same signature it is unpredictable in the sense that <coughs> if you give a random number it should be sort of a random output also so your fingerprint should not be like you know an add operation if i give one it will give two if i give two it will give three then you can predict what will be this challenge what will be the output right so in that way it should be unpredictable it's a one way function in the sense that you know if you give x you get y there should not be anything which will you know do the other way around if i give y you will get x right so the opposite should not be there then it should be tamper evident in case somebody damages it this y equal puff of x should not be existing okay so i hope you understood what is the puff and what is the properties <laughs> so this is sort of showing you know it's a little complicated but you know all it means is there is lot of things in the circuit ultimately there is a puff it's like a truth table right i give a challenge there is a acceptable response right that sort of says you know whether it's valid or not valid that's all this diagram means <clears throat> now some extra details you know it's uh, i think most of the crowd is computer science so this is more electronics so i'll skip over some of this this is sort of showing you know what are the delay uh, what are the different types of puffs you know delay puff memory puff and things like that uh, it's just you know a complicated circuit uh, where you know you are having signals coming in and this is sort of determining which signal came first that is what is shown here here d came first and then clock came here d came for sorry here uh, clock came first and then d came right why would the signal come first right in any complex circuit it's sort of a nature of the circuit which brings one signal slightly above or before or after the other signal that is completely related to the manufacturing of the device you cannot really control it right all you care about is when the clock come what is the input of d when the clock comes what is the input of d here maybe it's 1 maybe it's 0 right that is all the flip flop matters but 
which came first is used to understand what is the challenge and response right that is how this puff is manifest the different ways of creating this you know this is based on an oscillator you know i'm giving a particular frequency i'm giving another frequency so that combination is sort of giving a response as well okay now there are uh, different companies which are doing this uh, you know <coughs> whether uh, puff can be uh, used so intrinsic id verio or two companies which are doing that right so there is a lot of research being done uh, one of my phd students is working on creating her own puffs which is based on ro uh, ro puff right so that research is happening in our university and that's funded by dst okay all right so this is the fund i mentioned you know we have a government of india project in collaboration with iit patna where we are implementing designs and there is some communication protocols being made at iit patna right so the goal is you know can we make a solution which can be integratable to any right so two phd students are working in this project so let's come to the final topic uh, which is cyber security right so i was talking about hardware security as of uh, you know Uh, at least so far right so we went through the definitions of iot we went through the application with respect to the pollution and home automation right we went through how do you make a uh, channel secure right what is puffs and things like that right what is countermeasure what is risk and things like that now we are coming to a very specific case right so this is a contest that we had participated in so there is something called uh, cyber security awareness week which is seesaw right <laughs> so this is something we have participated twice uh, both in 2018 and 2019 uh, so you know it is hosted by different uh, place you know different universities in different countries uh, here the nodal agency is uh, iit kanpur computer science department uh, in usa it's new york university and there is uh, someone else in uh, europe and so on right so the challenge here is uh, challenge is uh, given to everyone let me challenge is given to everyone saying you know uh, here is a cyber security problem right what is the best way you can do the hacking so it's a lot of an ethical hacking right so how can you do a, a hacking into a iot device right that was the problem in 2018 so that is what i'm going to take up now right so the challenge was there is a smart bulb what is a smart bulb you can increase the brightness you can you know change colors you can you know do different things with it right so there is a smart bulb and let's say this is sitting in a defense establishment right so you know this is a regular bulb but let's assume you know like a wall like this so this is a defense drdo facility or navy facility or something right a building where there is a smart bulb sitting here instead of a regular bulb can you hack information via hacking this smart bulb right you know it sounds weird right so one of the main aspects of any of these uh, facilities is that you know information is secure right you are not allowed to bring in laptop you are not bringing in your smartphone and things like that right so can you actually send information via smart bulb please note that they are not saying you know can you just come near the bulb take the bulb and get some information right so you will get more marks if you are handling the bulb or getting the information from the bulb from a distance right you will get more marks if the fact that you are stealing information cannot be caught by anyone right you can also you know get caught right you can put a video camera and uh, you know watch something right that's one way of doing it right but you know what if you get caught and things like that right so there must be stealth in nature stealth as in you know nobody should know that information is being leaked or hacked right it should also not have proximity as in it should be from a distance okay <clears throat> so uh, the challenge is leaking information from the smart bulb right so how do you leak information without proximity as in how do you do it from a distance how do you leak information without internet right so if you have internet of course you can just email it right what is the need for doing all this right so we are talking about a secure facility where there is no internet right? and how do you provide stealth in the sense that <coughs> i am sending it as a covert information nobody is knowing that i am sending this right so we you know took a particular i let me just show the bulb actually so this will be a demonstration piece so i show you some so this is a smart bulb that was given i don't want to give away the brand of it right so this was sent to everyone right it's a common available thing right so this is sort of uh, 
you're having a mobile app along with it where you can select what is the color right now it's selected as white you can have it as blue green red anything right the intensity can be increased decreased right it's sort of programmable bulb right so how do you send information like this right and it is connected via bluetooth right so you know your mobile app can connect via bluetooth to the bulb and change all this information so <coughs> excuse me so the easiest way or the most common way so there are seven teams in the fray you know we from cochin university it madras bombay not bombay i think uh, madras kanpur uh, kharagpur uh, i triple it allahabad and so on right seven teams amrda university was there <coughs> so uh, the one of the means is hacking the bluetooth bluetooth is not a very secure means of communication there is a software called wireshark if you use it you can actually secure sorry uh, decrypt what is the data being sent right but uh, you know so we actually did that right so we got the decompiled value 56 in rr you know sort of giving the rgb white sort of thing right so it's a sample decrypt packet so this is showing that actual console where you can get what is the rgb values right so rgb values are given here white value is given here right so it is marked in the legend so if you use the bluetooth you know device uh, mobile app and send the value to the bulb you can get this right so it is one way communication right i am sending value into the bulb right it is not the other way around if you have to hack information you have to get information from the bulb right but i is just showing you know what are the different ways you can hack this right so in some ways it is an attack right it is a sniffing attack right <coughs> i am using the mobile app which is called nrf connect right and i am having access to the bulb now the problem is it needs proximity right bluetooth works when you are in the same room you can't work from a different distance another aspect is it is not stealth if you are going to change the color from white to blue or red people who see the bulb or walking past the bulb will see that this thing is changing color for no reason right <clears throat> so yeah this is a solution that was given by another uh, you know work where they said you can actually observe a smart bulb from a distance so this is the basis of our work right you can put a telescope and you can observe a bulb which is changing color and you know using a program connect it to a sensor and understand what is the color right so what is the benefit of doing that so let's say the intensity goes from 0 to 100 it could be measured as positive 1 Right, if the intensity goes from you know hundred to zero, this can be a binary zero. So if you make a circuit where you can decrypt the value, sorry, decrypt the values of the bulb based on the bulb brightness, you have come up with a way of hacking the bulb. Right, not hacking the bulb. Right, somebody inside can send information by turning on and off the intensity of the bulb. Right, somebody who's at a distance outside the campus. <clears throat> might be observing the bulb using a telescope and you know it sounds very weird but uh, you know we have physically demonstrated it that is the bulb and you will see that you know we have a circuit with a you know this is the app where you are changing the uh, thing you are having the telescope arrangement along with the circuit and so on right so we will come to that right so we have a cro and the whole thing right so i sounds weird but actually you can hack a smart bulb from a long distance right <clears throat> there is of course a lot of problems with this you know we showed it in a, a situation where the bulb is sitting in a relatively dark place right so the background intensity and the ambient light has a factor right so you need to tune it right but that also can be done right so you maybe you can just decide i'm going to work it only at the night right maybe that's good enough <clears throat> so this is sort of uh, you know how we decrypted it earlier we decided okay you know let's just use different colors as codes right if i want to send zeros and ones i'm going to maybe red is my zero my blue is my one so we needed to have a circuit where we are going to detect that i'm having zeros and ones detected as different colors right so we took a simple uh, you know uh, light monitoring intensity device connected it to an arduino board you might be all familiar with the arduino board which is one of the simplest of things to do right so you put the red color right you change the color you know you modify it based on the color it will identify there is more red than blue it will show that you know it's blue 
right more red it will show red right when it is more blue it will show more blue right so it's an easy way of detecting what is the color and if you associate a color with a particular you know uh, you know once it becomes green you will find that it is more green <coughs> blues will change to green right so yes yeah. that's a typical concept right <coughs> now just think about the three factors we have uh, very less proximity which is a very good thing right we are sitting from a long distance and viewing from the telescope so we have good marks on uh, this one but we don't have good marks on uh, stealth because if there is a security guard and if he sees that the color of the bulb is changing from green to blue he is going to make an investigation right so it's not stealth really right <clears throat> so this is sort of showing you know what is you were uh, we were detecting red we were detecting blue so you can just use ones and zeros right we created a small app where we can automatically do this also <clears throat> right Uh, so you know of course uh, we can't uh, sit and manually get ones and zeros and create any meaningful information right so you need to send you know 1000 bits uh, 100000 bits 1 lakh bits right that way you are going to get the red blue green information so we decided how can we improve this right so we came up with another technique which is sort of called pwm based destruction so we decided i am going to understand what is the intensity of each color <clears throat> inside this thing it is actually a pwm so 25% duty cycle for red will mean that intensity is 25% of red 50% duty cycle given to this bulb will say that 50% is green 75% duty cycle for the blue one will mean that this is blue 50 75% so the ambient color is a mix of red green blue in this proportion right okay i hope uh, i am making things clear if you have any questions please ask me <coughs> right so i'm going to make this assumption right <coughs> so how do i identify what is each color i am only seeing one color from the bulb right i don't know this ratio i can if i put a filter paper if i put a red filter paper between the detector and the bulb i will get only red value if i give a green filter i'll get only green value right <clears throat> so we went ahead and did that let me see if it is video 2 or 3 i think this is similar to the other one so it's video 3 right so this is vector and this is the one right sort of showing the same circuit thing so i mentioned it is a pwm right so it we are using a crr to understand the wave these are the three filter papers right so we are going to do the experiment by putting the filter paper in between you turn on the bulb it is a mixture of let's say starting with 128 of everything <coughs> which is the sender which is pure white <coughs> now we are going to change the color by you know reducing each intensity right <coughs> so this is showing the value at that point of time and we are going to now change the intensity to a certain color right it contains when it puts green you will see the wave will change right so the wave is showing only the wave obtained from that particular color right so that way you can understand three different signals right that's an improvement instead of just having intensity based one you can have this right so what is the benefit of doing this the benefit of doing this is that now you don't need to put the bulb as high brightness and low brightness you can have different color intensities maybe the bulb will change from red to uh, green a little bit right maybe the color is slightly changing maybe it's becoming magenta maybe it's becoming orange right maybe it's going from red to orange maybe the security guard cannot understand that there is something changing it may be very minor <clears throat> so that is the video 3 that we just saw right so you can uh, instead of just having the brightness you can just have the color differences also right so we had a circuit which can measure this and so on right <clears throat> now that is one method now we have to do even better because this filter paper and all that is good but the old problem is still there human being cannot sit and calculate all these things right 100 zero, zero, you know it will take forever right so we decided okay you know <clears throat> this brightness of each color we can sort of 
create into like a truth table if it is 10 percent brightness it means start bit okay if it is 70 percent brightness it is stop bit if it is 30 percent brightness it is zero if it is 40 percent brightness it is one so maybe at 35 there is sort of a threshold after which it becomes zero and one right so really if we decide that i am going to make this a blue color bulb right i just reduce the intensity and start the information and then go to 35 and just switch between 30 and 40 brightness if you switch between 30 and 40 brightness it may not be even visible in the it visible by the human eye it is minor change of brightness right but that is enough if you have an automated circuitry to send zeros and ones and if you can zeros and ones you can send anything right so that is the solution that we have proposed right so in our arduino console it will using the light detector it will detect okay no start bit came right and we send this many bits right and we decrypted it as okay no 106 right so we can put some code in there right so the advantage is now we have high accurate data Right, and persistence of vision in the sense that human eye you cannot see this <coughs> and there is another factor to this how fast is this moving we are talking about a pwm signal of two kilohertz it is moving so fast it may be going between zeros and ones the color might be changing so fast that we have persistence of vision problem right our eyes cannot detect that how fast this is going right so it is extremely stealth Right, so we were able to send, you know, it is 0.5 millisecond is the flickering speed, right? <clears throat> Human eye can probably detect 0.25 seconds, right? Forget one millisecond, right? This is 0.5 millisecond speed, right? So we will not be able to understand this 30 to 40 percent flickering that is happening, right? So the circuit will be, I'm having this light, there is a sensor, there is a detector, there is bits being recognized. Right, so I think I have shown this before. Right, you know, you can decide that I am going to use one particular color and uh, detect the zeros and ones just based on that. Right, so that is being shown in this final video. So you can see a stream of bits that was in the uh, device. So they are changing between 10 and 25, just show zeros and ones changed, right? In the <coughs> slide I had put 30 and 40, but you know, 10 and 25 button has been used to put zeros and ones, right? So you can send as many zeros and ones as you want, and it will switch back and, you know, reliably information has been changed. But in the bulb, there is so less change that you are not able to understand. But by decrypting into a, uh, in our circuit, using the PWM, we are able to understand what is the difference. Right. Okay. I hope that is clear. Okay. So yeah. So what others did, you know, people, everybody did the wire shark. These were the finalists, uh, you know, uh, video observing of this. That's another way of doing it. Right. So, uh, but still a human being has to sit and understand the information. So this is something that we came first. Uh, I think. Uh, Kharagpur and Madras uh, came second and third in 2018. 2019, uh, it was a cryptography thing, so that's why I went talked about it. Uh, these are my PhD students, Akhil and uh, Gisha, who worked on this project. Uh, you know, they are continuing their PhDs, one in software side and the other in the hardware side. She is working on the puff part and she he is working on the <coughs> um, optical and things like that. Okay, uh, so in 2019, we have come second. Uh, this is something that happens every year. Yeah, there is a website of the uh, Cyber Security Awareness Week. You can uh, see what are the problems put in there. If you do a sample thing also, they'll uh, take you to Kanpur and you know do the experiment. I think this year it may be a challenge with respect to the Corona, but yeah, let's see. So uh, takeaways of the talk, you know, advance of IOTs have uh, raised concerns on privacy and security, right? So of course, privacy and security are two big issues with IoT, right? So security is very important. Side channel attacks, you know, we talked about uh, puff. We talked about how people can have risk and countermeasures that can be done, right? So it's sort of an increasing thing, you know, people put in Trojans, how can you detect Trojans and things like that, right? So that's a big problem. 
now there are a lot of authentication <laughs> means you know there is pop uh, as one of the authentication means so similarly different ones have been uh, suggested now uh, information <coughs> leakage new new techniques continue to be found right so seesaw sort of gave this optical how can you hack it from a <coughs> bulb sort of uh, problem so we came up with something right so as people put more and more challenges people put more and more countermeasures also so we ourselves have come up with how can you solve this uh, these are, <clears throat> these are some emerging areas we are working on but i don't want to cover that today so uh, we'll conclude here so um, thank you for the patient listening i hope uh, you got some idea about uh, security for internet of things uh, you know if you have any questions you can connect me over email uh, that's my email uh, eldo sir has my number so you know you can connect through him also thank you if you have any questions i'll be able to answer them. Yeah, thank you, sir. Actually, participants have posted some questions in the chat box. Okay, sorry, I was not following that. Okay. It's okay, sir. Uh, shall I read it, sir? Read no, it that's, that's okay. okay. I can. Uh, okay. I'll start from the bottom. Uh, could you please elaborate on the types of attacks or threat in uh, IoT other than the eavesdropping? <laughs> So uh, side channel is uh, just one category of attack, right? So it is not, uh, you know, one attack, right? So I mentioned electromagnetic based uh, monitoring is there, right? So you have heard of EMI, EMC, right? Electromagnetic interference, right? So you can inject an inference, you can observe what is the response of it. Uh, you can, uh, you know, measure the power, you can measure the current. So all are different types of attacks. Right. So uh, I think if you just search for side channel attacks, uh, it can give you a lot more. Uh, you know, Trojans is a different area. So I would suggest that you uh, go into uh, side channel attack and see any physical quantity that can be put under attack is a problem. Right. Okay. Um, another one uh, related to malware detection IoT can machine learning algorithms can be used. Yes, it is the work. So the PhD student working on this is actually right now working in uh, machine learning for uh, Puff, right? So what is Puff? Puff is, yeah, Puff is really a, you know, challenge response pair, right? So if it is a challenge response pair, uh, if you have a particular pattern that is coming, machine learning algorithms will be able to predict what will be the pattern for something that is unknown, right? So uh, that is uh, a potential. But, uh, you know, of course, machine learning attacks are uh, very compute intensive. Right, so uh, it is not as easy. Uh, please mention your views on the advancement of lightweight cryptography. So, you know, I'm not an expert to say, you know, any authoritative uh, statement on this, uh, but you know, there is a huge challenge there because uh, you have to have things which work on microcontrollers, right? So, your typical cybersecurity algorithms don't come into play. Right, so you have to have intrinsic, you know, like puff like security where by nature it is secure sort of solutions, right? Rather than, okay, you know, I have a 128k, uh, 128 bit security, now I have 256 bit security, now I have 512 bit security. That sort of scaling cannot work in IoT, right? So, uh, so when it comes to lightweight, I would say that's my comment. Any other questions? So one more question is there. Sure. Related to malware detection in IoT, can the machine learning algorithm be implemented in low power IoT device or any lightweight portion there? Uh, I, I had I had mentioned that. Uh, so uh, malware detection, um, you know, for, forget malware. Like any hack into IoT, you know, any security that is added into IoT, if there is a pattern, there is a problem. Right? If there is a pattern there could be a prediction that could you know say you know okay for this particular thing this could be the answer right so in that way it is possible but i don't think you know malware iot and machine learning security need to be clubbed together right because malware is the problem when you say malware detection then you are talking about a good thing so i don't know why machine learning has to be put for uh, you know malware detection in iot Right, so if you have detected in solid data, if you're talking about, okay, I'm going to apply machine learning for understanding malware, 
then yeah probably there is research happening you know i am not uh, working on it so i don't have any additional information okay sir any other questions okay sir so i think we can wind up the session so thank you sir for such an informative session you have enlightened us with your words on introduction to iot real time application and challenges in iot and security in iot application and also cyber security so once again thank you sir for such an informative session so uh, thank you for the invitation uh, thank you elder sir and all the uh, participants for the patient listening you know it is more than 1 hour so it is a little difficult to give attention so Uh, thank you for uh, staying here thank you so for thank participants you. i also extend a thanks to all you for your active participation and interest for joining this session and we expect your wholehearted support and participation in all our future endeavor also so your e certificates will be mailed to your registered mail id so once again thank you all stay safe all of you thank you